Welcome everyone. My name is Caitlin Haskins. I'm the Communications Manager for Farm to Institution New England. Um, and I'm so glad you're joining us today for this Farm and Sea to Campus uh, Forum that's put on by Farm to Institution New England in partnership with the New England Farm and Sea to Campus Network and the Henry P. Kendall Foundation. Um, we're gonna have an awesome panel today um, with some people from campuses around New England. Um, so we hope you'll get a lot out of this that you can apply directly to your own work um, in, in your institutions around the country. Um, I, I'm so excited um, that we're, we're hosting this monthly uh, forum. We really hope you'll join us for future forums. So stay tuned for more information about those. Um, and as we get started, I'd like to introduce you to a few Zoom features. Um, the first one of which is our chat functionality. So you'll notice in your toolbar, your little Zoom toolbar, that there's an option to chat with people. Um, I invite you throughout the webinar to chat with our panelists, um, with everyone on the webinar today, um, or with, with specific people. So if you have any questions um, or comments or, or contributions you'd like to make, please feel free to do that throughout. Um, there's also a Q&A feature that we're going to turn our attention to near the end of the webinar today. Um, as you have questions, pl please feel free to put those in the Q&A um, toolbar and we'll address them at the end, as we have quite a lot of time um, allocated at the end of the webinar today for that, for that conversation. So now I would like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker of the day, my colleague, Mike Zastopol. He is our interim Farm and Seed Campus Network um, coordinator uh, in, the, in the absence of Dana Stevens, who's on maternity leave right now. Um, Mike is going to do a little introduction to FINE and to the Farm and Seed Campus Network, and then he'll pass it over to Holly, our facilitator for the day. So take it away, Mike. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, so yeah, welcome everyone. Um, so the outline for today is we'll do introductions um, and then we'll get right into our speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Mike Webster from the Hodgson School, followed by Mary Riley from Westfield State University. Uh, and finally, uh, David Gould from the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, after that, we'll have a Q&A um, and then a brief conclusion. So, Farm to Institution New England is the backbone organization for a six state network of nonprofit, public and private entities working to mobilize the power of regional institutions to transform our food system. We work to increase the amount of good local food served in our region schools, hospitals, colleges and other institutions. The fine network consists of nonprofit organizations, government agencies, institutions, farms, food distributors, food service operators and many others. Uh, for more information, you can visit our website at www.farmtoinstitution.org um, and one of the sections that, uh, one of the sectors that we focus on is the campus sector. And sorry about that. Uh, is the, and we do that through the pharmacy to campus network. Uh, this community is a community of higher education and food system stakeholders from New England who connect, share and collaborate to develop transparent regional food supply chains and educate campus communities about regional food systems. Um, so this forum series will have is a, is a new series, is a monthly event where we invite people to connect, share, and learn about farm to campus issues in New England. Each forum features a combination of guest speakers and open discussion. And today's topic is menuing for a regional food system. And with that, I would like to introduce our moderator, Holly Fowler. Holly is the CEO and co-founder of Northbound Ventures and working as a collaborator with the Henry P. Kendall Foundation. Welcome, Holly. Thanks, Mike. Um, your slides are determined to be <clears throat> sharing our faces right now, but um, I have a feeling technology will, will catch up with us. If we move on to the, the next slide, we have three great speakers, and as they have prepared for today, uh, you're going to hear a variety of strategies being used uh, to put more local and regional food on the, the menu specifically in, in New England for the case of this webinar. Uh, you'll hear examples from institutions who are working from a platform of determining menu based on what is uh, available locally. You'll hear strategies where, where the menu is quite fixed and it's a matter of incorporating what's available and local at the moment into the menu. And then accompanying strategies such as how to train up 
uh, staff in the food service uh, environment for being able to better accommodate local seasonal food when it does become available into the menu. So Mary, Mike, and David have all prepared slides, and we're going to jump right into it first with Mike Webster, who is the general manager at the Hotchkiss School. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Webster. Um, I'm the general manager of uh, dining in the Hotchkiss School. Uh, a little bit about Hotchkiss. It is a uh, co-educational, um, sorry, co-ed um, educational prep school of sorts in uh, northwestern Connecticut. We're right on the border of uh, the Hudson Valley and just south of the Berkshires. So we're in a really awesome local food uh, community. We have about 1,050 community members at whole. Um, so we're feeding a decent amount of people, um, but small enough that we're able to be fairly nimble with our menuing. Um, a lot of what we do here is uh, really focused on, on a home style uh, experience. And so unlike some of the uh, colleges and universities that have uh, a dining hall where there's different stations and activities, um, at Hotchkiss we really have one main focus uh, on our food. So it does give us a decent amount of uh, flexibility to be able to really design our menus the way we see fit, uh, to be able to support a regional food system, um, and also be able to teach our students a little bit about uh, healthy diet and exercise. So our students are fairly well engaged for the most part. Um, the farm is a big part of the Hotchkiss experience here. It's a 280 acre farm where the students are able to work uh, as their sport in the fall and in the spring sport seasons. And then everything the farm produces goes into the dining hall. Um, so the students uh, get out on the farm on a fairly regular basis. We also do events in their classrooms. Um, we do a culinary chemistry classes. We do um, you know, things with uh, uh, textbooks that they're, they're doing in, in science or math uh, and trying to apply it to a food system perspective as well. So the students are pretty well engaged, which is great. Our faculty and staff are very supportive. Um, the nature of a boarding school is that the faculty and staff, I'm sorry, the faculty live here on campus. And so uh, they dine with us on a regular basis as well. And lastly, our dining team, um, we've got about a 50-50 mix. Some of them care a lot uh, and others of them see it as just one extra step. So uh, again, mentioning to what uh, Holly said earlier about making sure that you're training up your employees to be able to meet the expectation. So one of the things that we've done at Hotchkiss um, as we've transitioned over from commodity food systems to a more regional supply chain um, is really focusing on the quality of our products and less on the quantity. Um, we have one primary omnivore entree for dinner uh, or lunch and then the peripheral of that is supported by a tremendous amount of plant-based proteins um, and uh, a limited amount of additional proteins like a grilled chicken on the salad bar or of course our, our deli meats for lunch. Um, but we really focus on the quality of our food and and that has allowed us to spend a little bit more money um, on that regional food purchasing because we're not offering uh, you know, a, a ham and a roast beef and a chicken for dinner. It's just going to be one of those and really focus on that. A lot of what we do is focusing on the health and nutrition um, because our students are, are here and they're forming uh, lifelong habits around their consumption, we really want to model what a good healthy diet looks like for them. Um, we think that sets them up for success, but is also a, a key component of the way that we menu. Um, at Hotchkiss, we have a whole animal program where we purchase whole animals. Um, and so that allows us to be able to save some money, but also really invest in the local procurement of high quality um, foods. And so by developing relationships with our farmers, we're able to get all grass fed beef and pastured pork. Um, and a lot of that has come uh, in, in time. It's certainly been a long time coming in terms of establishing those relationships and, and building up the supply chain. Um, and a lot of that has really come from the folks that work in our dining department, um, the farmer that we have out on, on our farm, and the, the team as a whole to just always kind of reach out to folks if they're in a restaurant or at a farmer's market, um, you know, really trying to develop those relationships. And I think lastly, one of the things that we try to do is manage our students' expectations. Um, you know, for us in a boarding school, it's all about the, uh, what the peer schools are doing. You know, what is Choate doing or what is Taft doing that is cooler uh, or better than what we're doing. Um, and so we've really tried to focus on, on managing our students' expectations for why they're going to want to eat high quality, nutritious food. Um, and even though that does come at the sacrifice of, of choice or selection. So a lot of the challenges that we've had, um, certainly New England, uh, you know, the, the seasons change. Right now we're experiencing a fairly cold spring that's going to make a really big difference um, 
in the time that we're able to get our plants into the ground and, and be able to start getting some production. Um, so a lot of what we try to do is meet with our farmers in advance uh, to know what they're you know, going to want to be planting and what we're going to be needing. So when you're talking with a farmer in the beginning of the season to say, I'm going to need, you know, 500 pounds of cabbage every month, um, they're going to be able to plan for that. And so that's helpful. Um, you also want to try to think about buying what's available. Um, so we're, we're always kind of balancing the uh, what Mother Nature is producing with what it is that we want Mother Nature to produce. Um, and one of the things that we've found works really well in New England has been the, the low volume, um, high impact items. So things like potatoes and grains and legumes are fairly um, you know, low in, in cost uh, and are still able to make a, a good impact on a regional uh, supply chain. In regards to sourcing, um, it's been really hard to, to develop the sources for the things that we're looking for. Um, but going to farmers markets and, and meeting farmers and, and then of course meeting uh, you know, new farmers kind of through that network um, has really helped us to build relationships to make sure that we're getting the things that we need at cost we can afford. And that brings me to cost. So cost of uh, supporting a regional food system obviously is, is greater uh, on the upfront dollar per dollar uh, per pound cost. Um, however, when, when when we've started uh, looking at creative ways to save money um, and reduce the costs in other ways, we've found that uh, switching to a regional supply chain has been essentially cost neutral for us. Um, things like blended burgers. So when we buy bison, for instance, uh, bison's a fairly lean meat. Um, it's also a fairly expensive meat. But by mixing it up with ground mushrooms, we found that uh, we can not only get a better product, but we can also afford to stretch the, the product and lower the overall price per pound. Um, Supporting plant-based proteins has been a really great opportunity for us to be able to continue to meet the needs of the community while still focusing on um, you know, the quality of the product that we're serving. So we invest heavily in plant-based proteins. And then the ability to really highlight and focus on the local and, and why it matters. Um, when your community is able to understand the whys, it makes it a little bit easier for them to you know, understand the sacrifices or the trade-offs of, of what it is that you're trying to do. And lastly, recipes. Um, as we've switched to a, a regional supply chain, it has been a challenge to keep consistent recipes. Um, I think that's something that we all kind of struggle with across the board in this industry is making sure that the same person that's making the potato salad today, uh, you know, makes it the same way that the person made it last week. Um, so the things that we've done for some of our recipes are finding things that are are simple uh, and fairly diverse in their application. So two simple examples that I'm going to talk about real briefly is just the lemon vinaigrette. Um, so it's just a, a basic, you know, ratio um, vinaigrette, and it's good for marinating poultry, it's good for marinating vegetables, it's good as a salad dressing, it's good for finishing things. Um, and that's something that you can universally apply regardless of you know, the fact that you may have to change your vegetable two or three times throughout a, a dinner service to be able to keep up with the production of, of what's locally available. Um, and so I think these are some of the things that we've uh, worked hard on uh, over the years and by it's no means perfect, um, but we're always trying to come up with new solutions. And I think the, the fundamental idea that just because it doesn't work the first time doesn't mean that it can't work again um, has been something that's been really driving our um, our management team and our cooks for a long time. And lastly, I've just got a sample menu here. If anybody is curious at taking a look at that um, to just kind of see how our menus are focused. Um, we have a standard breakfast, so we only do a full breakfast on Thursdays and Sundays. Um, full breakfast for us is the addition of a breakfast meat. We do not offer breakfast meats every morning, um, but we make them uh, in house from scratch. And so that's what our production allows for. And so that's what we're offering. We always do uh, soups and then we really try to focus on, you know, that one core item. So if we're going to do um, hot dogs, they're going to be local and grass fed. Um, and so, you know, while it might just be a hot dog that day, we're going to add, you know, lots of toppings and lots of fun and, and kind of get some excitement around it in other ways, as opposed to having, you know, the hot dog and the hamburger and the barbecue chicken and whatnot um, for a traditional kind of picnic meal. Um, and that is what I've got. And I will pass it off to Mary Riley with what she's doing at uh, Westfield State. Great, thanks, Mike. I'm just gonna, um, there we go. Here I am. Um, so, hold on, sorry, my technology, there we go. So I'm the executive chef at Westfield State University. Um, we're in Westfield, Massachusetts, which is Western Mass, so not quite the Berkshires, um, not quite Worcester. So um, we're about two hours west of Boston. Um, 
<clears throat> in terms of uh, campus life, we've got about 4,700 students enrolled and about two thirds of them are in our meal plan. And I'm using uh, last year's fiscal year numbers here. Um, we are a self-operated dining institution. We uh, became self-op in the summer of 2016. So we're fairly new to um, doing this ourselves. Formerly, this was a Sodexo managed account. Um, and in terms of local and regional food, it was one of the major drivers for bringing us onto this campus uh, for the campus becoming a self-operated dining services program. Um, that said, our students, you know, they're somewhat engaged. I think they understand the buzzwords or they know the buzzwords. Um, but you know, they might tell me they want organic, local, and sustainable, but then still ask me for hot dogs and chicken nuggets. Um, so I say we're still in the learning and education phase with that. Um, and our dining services team, like Mike's, we're about 50-50 when it comes to embracing local food. We have folks on staff who are, you know, active gardeners and hunters and, um, and no farmers. So they get very jazzed about what we're doing. And then there's a lot of folks who have just worked in food service kitchens for most of their lives. And, and some of the changes we're making, we have to work a little hard to make the sell to them. That said, um, so just to give you the environment in which we're working, every day we serve about 6,000 meals. Uh, that happens uh, with uh, 250 staff members. We have a mixture of full-time staffers, uh, part-time, and then of course student workers. We have one dining commons that services those 6,000, sorry, those, um, those students. Um, that dining commons has many, many stations. Um, in the dining commons, our chef's table and allergen free stations have um, menus that are on a four week menu cycle. And then the remainder of our stations are on a, um, you know, same thing every day. Our deli is always our deli, maybe with a specialty sandwich at times. Uh, but those, those stations tend to be pretty static. Um, we also have five retail locations, a bake shop, and a catering operation. Our menu planning is primarily a four-week menu cycle. We use Food Pro as our menu planner, and um, we actually set our menus um, about, you know, we set them ahead of the semester. So I, in December of this year, I was actually planning on what I would be serving in a very general way in May, but we do our tighter planning about three to four weeks ahead, which allows us to take advantage of what's available to us locally and seasonally. We define local as 250 miles from our campus, um, and, uh, but I do try to concentrate as much as I can into that 100 mile radius. And about um, a quarter of our com dining commons food spending, which is the location where we track our local, about a quarter of that is within that 250 mile radius this year, which is a pretty big jump from where we were at the start of last year. So I'm pretty happy about that. And uh, you might say, how do, we, how do we do that? How can I do that? So menuing is a huge thing. Um, I wish I had the flexibility Mike did to actually wait for, um, wait for the stuff to show up and write a menu, but I, I don't have that level of flexibility. So what we have done is created um, generic menu placeholders in our menu management system. For instance, vegetables. Um, obviously, in New England, in the um, colder months, we have a, a fairly limited selection of what we can bring in, but I know I can get uh, stored over winter squashes, sweet potatoes, um, usually greens of some kind from high tunnels, cabbages. So we basically have created a local vegetable slot in our menu cycle. And um, our kids tend to like their vegetables pretty unadorned. So those are usually roasted, steamed, sauteed. So we can, a couple weeks out, say, all right, we know we've got um, a bunch of butternut squash coming in. We'll be able to work with that. Or cabbage. Uh, we can do a slaw. We can do a saute. We can do a braise. So it, it lets us be a little more flexible in what we're menuing, but uh, still being able to take advantage of what's available local. Uh, the other thing we do is look at our standard items, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second, um, and see where we can make tweaks, where we can tweak those things, those items we serve on a daily basis. So for instance, a um, big success for us was on our stir fry station. This station is open from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day, except Friday and Saturday when it closes at 9. Um, we developed a partnership with Northeast Family Farms um, that's a through Dolan Bailey. Um, we're basically bringing in New York raised grass-fed beef. It allowed us to switch from an Australian product. 
we're currently using, as you can see, about 300 pounds a week. And in this case, we actually had a net um, it gain on, um, on cost savings. It was actually cheaper than the product we were bringing in from Australia. It's a great product. It's saving us money. And the kids love it. And they don't really care where it's from. They're just happy that they get this really delicious beef um, on a daily basis. Another is on our salad bar. We, um, here in uh, New England, there's a um, farm called Little Leaf, which is based in Devons, Massachusetts, and they're a hydroponic, 100% solar powered greenhouse system. We switched to them from California grown mesclun for our salad bar, which is open all day, every day. Um, it is a little more expensive than that California product. However, because it is fresher, it comes to us so much closer to harvest, we don't have the waste. We don't get that horrible, rotten, mescaline sensation when you open that box of California-grown commodity stuff that we've been getting. Um, so we're actually, we're spending a little more, but our yield is substantially better. Also because the lettuce has a better loft to it, it actually rises up on the plate. So the kids feel like they're getting a more full plate without going back in and in and in. Another big thing for us here in the Northeast um, was with Red's Best, which is a seafood distributor out of Boston. And uh, we wanted to be able to offer the kids a great selection of local seafood. Um, sustainable sourcing and seafood is personally very important to me. And so what we do with Reds is uh, we, we're in their catch of the day program. So we're basically locked into a set price. So I don't have any variability on my fish cost. It's always five seventy five. dollars and, um, but I do get variability in species. So that's been actually pretty amazing. Today we got Pollock, but we also got Cusk. And Cusk is not something my staff is, would have ever seen before. Um, cooks up beautifully, has a great, nice, mild white flake to it. Um, so in this case, what we've had to do is create, like Mike has, a couple of base recipes that we can use in multiple applications. So I've got a couple basic preps for fish, and when we see what we're getting in, we sort of decide how we're going to serve it that day. Um, it's, it's easy for the kitchen staff and the kids get something they enjoy and it's delicious. And I can tell them with honesty that that fish was landed the day before it came to school, which is some of the freshest fish we, we could possibly serve. Um, and then just two easy wins um, that we had in our program. And one, I'll give you a caveat. So um, we'll get to that one second. But fluid milk. Um, if you're serving milk in your program, you're probably already using a local product. Um, just the nature of the dairy industry, uh, milk doesn't tend to go too far from its source. There are varying qualities of milk, obviously. We, um, we were using a more commodity product and recently moved over to High Lawn Farms, and, um, and which is a, a dairy based in Lee, Massachusetts. So we were local and we stayed local with our milk, but the quality of the product was significantly better, uh, more delicious, and frankly had a better shelf life on it. Now the other thing we did is move this past semester, um, beginning, sorry, the beginning of this school year, we moved to 100% cage-free eggs. And this was partly driven by students' uh, concerns around animal welfare, but also our desire to serve a better product. So um, the quality of the eggs is significantly better than liquid eggs. Um, it was very amusing in the first couple of weeks of menuing them. We had a number of kids ask us why they were so yellow and uh, thought we were putting food coloring in the eggs because they just the color on them was just so much more vibrant. Um, our, our price per dozen is obviously higher than that of a commodity egg or a liquid egg. Um, and the only way we could make them work um, from a labor perspective is we purchased something called an egg cracker. Um, and you guys have my contact information. Feel free to follow up with me offline if you want more information about one. But um, an egg cracker is a magical machine <laughs> that you pour eggs into and liquid eggs come out. Um, they're not inexpensive. They're about $5,000. But you can crack 15 dozen eggs in a minute. And um, it's been a remarkable productivity win for the kitchen. Plus, it's been a really great, um, fun talking and selling point for the kids. So with, with those changes, just we've made a few other small ones, but, but those big ones that I've highlighted there are um, really some ways that we made a huge, um, a huge impact in our local numbers in a fairly quick way. So with that, I'm going to um, pass us over to David from RISD, and I'd love to hear more about what he's doing there.
Thank you, Mary and, and Mike and, and everybody. I'm excited to be here. Um, uh, my name is David Gould. I'm the executive chef for RISD Dining and RISD Caters um, in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, we are uh, but we would consider sort of a small, um, a small school in urban uh, Providence. Um, we're an art and design school comprised of about 2,400 students between undergrad and graduate students. We have about uh, 1,500 beds on campus and we've, t we've tied in obviously our meal plan with um, our bed count. So now recently, we, which is, I'll speak to this later, but um, we've um, worked with ResLife to, to require some sort of meal plan for all students who live on, in an on-campus bed. Um, so within that, we have a, just over 1,600 students on um, one of our meal plans. Um, we are a self-op dining program um, that's comprised of two residential um, venues. One is a, our, our largest sort of mothership um, that's mainly, it's all you care to eat and it's within our, uh, the freshman dorm. Um, and our second um, residential building is on the first floor of a very large, um, it's apartment style uh, dorm building um, that serves in a smaller scale and is um, a la carte set up. We also run um, a sandwich shop, an organic salad and sort of wrap slash burrito um, place. Um, we co-manage a coffee shop with students. We have a food truck and um, a full service catering division. Um, and so within all of, all of those um, portion, factors, we, we really have worked to really push our local, local sourcing throughout everywhere we sort of can within each of those, of those venues. Um, and we're seeing um, that our students um, are very sort of typical Generation X and that they're, they're, they're passionate. I think somebody mentioned those sort of buzzwords. They're really passionate about sourcing and sustainability and local and organic and whatever the, all those other words. Um, but then when it comes to actually, actually understanding sort of what that means, that if we were to go to a, a strictly only um, seasonal uh, menu mix, that ultimately that would mean that they wouldn't be able to get their cherry tomatoes um, on the salad bar in February. And so, and we, you know, similar thing, we, we've moved um, to, uh, we've gone cupless in, in two of our largest venues, uh, disposable, we've nixed sort of disposable cups and, and, and students have, our, the first reaction was that they were enraged because you know they it, we, they would have to keep um, a reusable cup with them all the time and they wouldn't be able to stuff chicken fingers into disposable cups um, but sort of you know slowly as we as, as we sort of get to this understanding of for us to really be able to get to the point where we're trying to get and give and give them the sort of balance of, of, of what you know a sustainable balance of what we can do um, in terms of sourcing locally and menuing um, in terms of what's in season in New England they have to, you know, there, there has to be an understanding that ultimately we'll, we'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll keep tomatoes on the, on the salad bar during February, but, but I might not market it. It might be, it, I'm not gonna take pictures of it on, on our Facebook account. And we're not gonna talk about it. It's there. Um, but, um, you know, with, with that, it also means that they also might see a lot of um, root vegetables during the winter, for example, and, very, you know, varying in, in many different ways. Um, but that it, towards the end of March, they're ultimately going to be sick of root vegetables because ultimately I want them to be really thinking about what they're eating and, and, and for them to realize that I am really sick of something. It, may, it means to me that they're thinking about what else is, is to come. And that's a really sort of interesting um, realization for students to think, oh my God, I'm so sick of this, but I can't wait to, I can't wait to eat that first spear of asparagus. Um, so um, anyway, so, okay. So our dining team, um, we have, I'm sure like most um, other colleges, our staff is made up of, a lot a very dedicated um staff that's been here for a long time and also a lot of sort of newbies um and so within that i i think it's sort of an estimate but realistically we're we're at about a 60 60 40 split 60 percent of our staff are really excited and and engaged um with our with our focus to move really trying to to, to source as, as locally as we can and 40 percent of those sort of naysayers that are just about coming to work for a paycheck and you know, don't like any extra work and they just don't feel like it. So we're, we're really trying to work with um, both sides to, to get to a place where everyone's engaged and, and ultimately can speak to what our um, goals are to, to the campus community. Okay, how do I do? 
I'm just trying to get to the next slide and I can't see, there we go. Okay, um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about our core, value, core values, which is something that we've designed within our department to really try and change the culture of um, dining and catering sort of in, within RISD, not so much to, to tutor on horn, but really as, a, as, a, as an idea for other, other schools to sort of think about um, ways of, of ultimately getting more backing and also more sort of street cred for what you're doing. Um, of course, we've written it in the RISD acronym, but um, we're based off of relationships, ingredients, sustainability, and, and design. Um, and within that, we foster relationships with New England farmers, artisans, and vendors. We design our menus to so showcase locally sourced seasonal ingredients, and we support the long-term sustainability of our, of our communities. Um, I outlined some of the sort of what I thought are sort of the bare necessities for, for success within um, trying to move towards a more um, locally sourced dining program. Um, and these are just some of the sort of tricks that I've found have been to be very helpful. Um, first and foremost, find the people that are really going to be your advocates, whether, you know, uh, foodies or um, professors that are teaching some sort of food related class on, on campus. Um, find those people that have really elaborate gardens and happen to also be on the cabinet or in, uh, on faculty and have a say and, and really sort of start talking um, to them about what your goals are and, and why. And also ultimately to students and, and, and sort of, do, you know, in your surveys and, and um, focus groups or even just touring the dining hall at night, just sort of ask students what they think and what they're looking for and, and just sort of feel it out from there. Um, and that'll end up, I think, it helped us sort of gauge how and, and where to sort of start. Um, within that, um, the second thing is really understanding the need for a training system. Um, because ultimately, if your staff don't, don't, aren't buying into it, they're going, the negative, their sort of negativity is, is going to be felt by the student body. And that's like, the, the, to me, that's one of the most important things to really avoid. Um, we want it to be only positive and for, for students to be really excited about it. And for that to really happen, staff have to be excited about it also. Um, and so in doing that, we've, we've um, distributed consistent talking point, points about what our goals are and, and how we're doing it in terms of where, what farms we're buying from, what seasons we're serving things in, why we're not, you know, why students are seeing some of the, some similar vegetables over and over again, even though they're in different preparation, we're cooking them in different preparations to, for, for them to sort of understand that, you know, there's always this thing that we're seeing with students that no matter what we do, that they don't get enough variety and it's too much of the same thing over and over again. And so we found that by taking away some of the, some of the actual variety that we've, that we've given them over the years and then giving them, you know, pop-up stations or build your own stations or action stations or bring in events or guest chefs, it's ultimately, we're ultimately serving a lot of the same stuff, but the way that we're formatting it makes it seem like it's, it's interesting and new. And also we're educating them in, in, about what it means to buy locally and why you, you know, why through the month of May, you're gonna have asparagus. Ultimately, there's gonna be asparagus in some way um, at all of our dining venues from that, that we're sourcing locally. And you're gonna, you know, and you can either eat it all day long like me or not, but that's the sort of understanding behind it. Um, we've really prioritized what it means to be truth, uh, truth in menus, um, understanding how to write a menu that students are gonna see. You know, we don't want sort of very specific flowery verbiage about how it's being prepared and what it's garnished with. It really can, it's about sort of understanding and writing where the farm, where the, where the produce or where the ingredients from a couple of the flavors sort of profiles around that um, and leaving some flexibility within those, the, the menu mix and, and, and the, and the descriptions for those just in case sort of last minute changes that we, we inevitably have to all sort of deal with because, you know, let's say it, it was cold last week. And so all of the, I, we didn't get the, the greens that we were supposed to get or something. Um, it, within your staff that you already have, seek out those, the, those who are really passionate about learning new things and understanding what it means to, to buy locally and, you know, um, and, and they can also be um, ambassadors for you in terms of sort of pep talks with staff and students. Um, and we found that to be very helpful because we can't be at every venue all the time. And so to have someone that you can sort of depend on and, and trust to, to use those, those talking points is very helpful. If um, you're able to, to, to restructure or think about newer hiring strategies, think about finding people besides sort of the typical, like, are they responsible? Are they going to show up? Are they going to take advantage of, of us? Are they, you know, still whatever. Also think about someone who's 
people who are focused on food and hospitality and, and, and ask those questions in the hiring um, interviews to, to, so you can really get an understanding for what's their take on, on sort of food and what it means to them before they come into your organization. Um, the third thing, be flexible and strategic in budgeting. And, and both Mike and, and Mary have, have mentioned this, is, and this I think is one of the most um, stressful uh, things about, about changing people's buying methods and going more locally sourced. Um, for us, we, we have very strict, men, uh, very strict budgets, but in term, we're very strict in terms of a budget year to year, but for us, it's not about a line by line or day by day process. Um, and I'll talk about menu management and, and sort of menu rotations after this, but really look at sort of what you can do to save some, save some dollars in one week and then the next week to figure out if you can splurge a little bit more. And also working with, really, working with our relationships with farmers or vendors or nonprofits for us, which is like Farm Fresh, um, to really figure out ways of saving money if that means that we're forecasting numbers and we're pre-buying um, in bulk, or we're taking advantage of um, some a surplus of, of pork butts from Blackbird Farm that she just needs to get rid of because she needs the freezer space, or sort of really understanding the need for relationships within that really will help, has helped us be, be strategic in our, in our um, budgeting, um, Sort of process year to year. Um, and with that, we've been able to use the data from um, previous uh, years and semesters to really understand sort of ultimately a, a rough estimate of what we're going to need. And with those numbers, we, we've, we've been able to pre-buy um, in bulk. And that does a number of things. Most importantly to me is that it really supports um, small farmers um, when they need cash, not sort of after they've already Put all, put all the input in, but ultimately before that. Um, and then the last thing uh, that I think is just as important is, is many rotations. And I think that um, I, I want to leave time for people to ask questions about this in terms of recipes and many rotations. But for us, we've we use Computrition currently, and I'm not happy about it. Um, but um, We've been able to be, we've decided that it's important to be flexible in, that, in our menu rotations. And so what started originally with, with what, when I first started here, it was a six week menu cycle throughout all of our stations and venues. I've really stretched um, to be more of a, a year wide rotation, taking a core of like eight or nine weeks of worth of recipes and rewriting those in a way that I can pull out certain seasonal additions or subtractions and understanding that that if I'm serving this dish, let's say something that you know that that's um, a sort of standard lunch entree that would be served with um, in the September would be served with tomatoes and corn. Then during the winter would be with with root veg, and then um, in May would be with asparagus. Something that I can sort of pull in and out and be flexible within those recipes. In the same way that that Mary is using Red's best. Um, catch of the day program, it's, it's a very similar thing. So we're using those placeholders um, and going in, taking sort of taking a few years to really tailor down this menu cycle and put in these, these recipes that, take, that they're taking into account what we're getting locally. And in that moment, just because it's springtime doesn't mean that we're able to get asparagus locally yet, as you can probably tell from the temperature outside here in New England. Um, so taking, you know, and understanding that there may, may need to be some flexibility within that. Um, and I think that's, so All then right. lastly, I'm sorry. So, so lastly, um, also the most important thing is buy-in and you need buy-in from your students. You need buy-in from faculty. You need buy-in from cabinet. You need buy-in from your staff. And so think, really think about ways that you can increase what you, the buy-in from these people. Um, for us with that, it's, it's much easier said than done. Um, but for us, what that's meant is we've, we've, we've hosted events, um, every year. Um, bringing in farmers or, or, or guest chefs from local restaurants, fishermen, butchers, telling us, telling their story to students and to staff so they can really see the person behind the food that they're eating. Um, and, then we, and then we menu a dish that, that, that's using their stuff um, in one of our venues. Um, and then also, of course, social media is huge. And, and for us, what that's meant is, is it's, it's about telling our story about what we're trying to do. And, you know, we're not a big school that has a separate marketing department. Ultimately, the person that does the, the social media for our department is, is myself or my executive director, my boss. And so really, you know, we're 
um, that's sort of an easier, cheaper, quicker way of, of getting information to students about what we're trying to do, keep them information, keep them sort of in the know and, um, and get feedback. And then also you take advantage of RAs because for us, um, we help them tremendously in terms of some of their initiatives and, and um, we're really happy to work with them and they've been happy to work with us to sort of spread some of our initiatives and, and give us, um, um, sort of speak us up, talk us up to, to, to students. So I think that's all that I have to say for, for that. And I look forward to everyone's questions. Terrific. So um, thanks everyone. This is the voice of, of Holly again. I wanna thank uh, David, Mary, and Mike for their excellent uh, presentations. And uh, a quick note for folks who might not have found it yet. Uh, if you click on the chat button at the bottom of your page, you will join us in the chat. There's also a button there for Q&A and I can see that there's a, a question that's popped up there. So um, two ways to both chime into the conversation, offer your own insights and expertise to the group uh, via the chat, and I'll also help uh, direct questions uh, via the q and I did have um, one first question from David, your presentation, because you touched on it so eloquently, the, the, the framing of how you present these items on the menu. And I'm wondering from any of the three panelists, if you have actually tracked or seen a difference in how you identify a local regional item on your menu to your customer base and whether you see a direct impact in terms of their selection of that item versus perhaps the traditional item it might be replacing. Has, um, have, any of, have, you, have any of you had the chance to actually track what the impact of, of identification on the menu has done? And also, again, with any of these questions that we're going to direct to the panelists, I encourage anyone to chime in on their own experience on the, on the chat board. So D David, maybe we'll start with you and then we'll just- Yeah, sure. Um, I, I don't have actual data on that, but I, I, I can tell you in terms of how much, I, how much I'm buying versus, you know, now versus before. And I think that um, I'm not necessarily seeing more, we, because things change so frequently here. I mean, there's few sort of stagnant stations, um, or I shouldn't say stagnant, but the sort of stations that stay the same um, season to season, you know, but one of them, for example, is um, our deli. And so really the only thing that sort of changes off of a deli station would, for us would be sort of house-made sauces, um, tomatoes, tomato see, you know, we'll, we'll be featuring more sort of tomato-centric items in the menu mix during the summertime than we would be when it's not tomato season. So in that, in that case, then we definitely see more tomatoes being eaten during tomato season because it's sort of much, we're serving much cooler sort of tomato-centric dishes versus just having a slice of tomato on people's sandwiches. Um, but if I was to serve, uh, tell me if I'm not understanding your question correctly, but if I was to serve sort of one day, it, it would be, um, you know, some sort of roasted beets and lentil salad or something that was, that was using a local beet versus the same dish not using a local, di a local beet and they were side by side during the same day. I think that without a doubt, the local beet would, would, we would sell more of. I don't know if that's necessarily because students really in, uh, genuinely understand the scope of what that means or, much, or more just because they think it's cooler and, and it has those buzzwords. But I think it's our opportunity as chefs to, to, to sort of take advantage of that and educate them through, through those processes and, and, and help them understand that. And also for us, it's, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to give them, I don't want to make them feel like it's a test, you know, so putting things side by side like that might make someone, I don't know, uncertain or something. So just give them, to me, it's like pick and choose what you're going to serve that's sourced locally, really me menu it up and market it on Facebook, put it on Instagram, put it in your menus on the screens throughout the dining halls on, on the websites and, um, and talk less about the things that aren't in season. Great. Yeah. I, um, I, I don't advocate for putting things side by side to do that kind of test, but I wondered if, you know, as, as you've shared anecdotally, if you notice a difference, um, Mary, have you had a chance to track that at all or Mike? 
You know, we do not track um, the, the specifics of, of kind of the consumption. I track the overall consumption in terms of semesters, you know, kind of year over year. Um, and as we have transitioned to the more regional uh, food sources, we have definitely seen an increase in consumption. Um, and so even when taking account into food waste, we've still seen positive traction in terms of the overall consumption of the, the local or regional food. So I'd say overall, it seems that um, you know, the community seems to be embracing it. Great. Yeah, and I, I would echo that. Um, I think, again, we don't track side by side. In fact, we need to do a much better job of actively marketing what we're doing um, to our kids. But I think that, you know, that local stuff just tends to look better. Like the lettuce is such a good example or the fish is a great example because it's just, it's a better quality product. And as we know, those of us who are chefs or prepare food on a regular basis, if you have better ingredients, you're going to have a better dish going out the door and so we'll have um we'll have better adoption from the kids um and i do, i have seen it with fish we actually have we're selling a lot more of it than we did when i first came on board when most of what we brought in was frozen um you know uh fsa sorry fas fish and now because what we're getting in is just so so vibrant and lovely i mean i think i think they're a little feeling braver and they're they're trying more things Great. Can I speak, uh, Holly, can I speak one more thing about that? Also, sure. I think also, I, I've noticed one thing also, um, when we're, you, you know, there's obviously much more labor that goes into, into um, prepping and then cooking and serving, garnishing, all these things in terms of the actual labor. But I think that staff really get excited and are, are more invested in what they're serving. If it's something that they can take pride in and they see that they see the sort of beginning to end process, that the, you know, if they've met the farmer because we brought them in for an event, they see Farm Fresh sort of tag it on Facebook or something, then they're, they're the ones who are sort of steaming, peeling, cutting, roasting the beets or something. And then, and then serving it. And I think that sort of um, excitement really speaks, students really see that. And I think it, it comes out in sort of every single, every single hotel pan that you send out of whatever it is, it, it'll be that much nicer every single time because so much, someone is, the person who made it is that much more excited about it. And that sort of positivity I think is definitely contagious and really helps to sort of students pick up on that. Um, and then also, if I didn't answer the, your question correctly the first time, I think ultimately what we're seeing, you know, maybe looking back four or five years ago before we really um, were pushing for, for much more locally um, sourced food is that we've definitely, we, we're almost to the point where we're, we're going through, we're selling um, half as, like double as much. So it's like 150, we're serving 150% more than we were four years ago. And that's proportional to, if it, were, if it were to the same number of meal plans sold, if that makes sense. Great, <clears throat> great. Thank you, all three of you. Um, turning to the first question on the, the Q&A, um, this is from John Tureen uh, and is directed at David, which is the recipes and recipes strategy that you mentioned. Is that something that your current uh, menu management technology allows you to easily do or you know is it as easy as a in john's words a plug and play where you can kind of swap things in or out or is that one of the features of your current system that perhaps is less less uh useful to you at the moment so um as i mentioned before we use computrition um, which is a menu management system that RISD has used now. I think it's about 10 years. And it has, you know, to be totally honest, it's, it hasn't been, it's, it's not very user friendly and we haven't really been able to, to um, utilize all of its features to the extent that it can be. And so if anyone out there is using competition and, and is having success with it, I would love to hear from you. Um, but so I think that I'm, I, I haven't actually used any other management system, menu management system before, besides competition, but I'm pretty sure that res, a recipe within a recipe, you know, is, is a pretty standard um, uh, idea for whether it's Seaboard or Food Pro. It just means that ultimately that, you know, instead of having a complete dish within one recipe, um, we'll have several different recipes and then within a complete recipe. So when, the next time that that comes up in the rotation, I can take out the roasted Brussels sprouts and butternut squash and I can put in um, grilled asparagus. 
um, which, you know, which we're doing sort of season by season. Um, but once we, but once we do that work, it's sort of, then it's already done. So we can just repeat it again. Um, I'm not sure if, I hope that answers the question. I'll let, um, I'll let John, uh, Tareen type into the chat board whether or not that, that, that answered the question or not since it came from him. Um, I'm navigating the chat and the Q&A and I'm trying to um, prioritize some questions maybe about uh, menuing, but I would encourage the panelists to go ahead and answer any questions directly in, on either platform that are more generally about uh, local sourcing and some of those challenges. One of the uh, questions I want to pull out from here related to menuing is whether or not the panelists feel that having more uh, lightly processed or the raw product come in versus having a fully prepared item uh, makes it easier to menu. So for example, is it easier for you to menu in things that are say apple slices or is it easier to menu in things that come in as say apple crisp? I think for us, it's always easier to have the lightly processed, provided that the finance lines up. You know, I think anything, anytime we can have um, a little extra helping hand to be able to keep the production team happy, uh, that's a, an easy win. Um, but if the cost of having a lightly processed item is greater than the labor, then it obviously doesn't make financial sense. But when possible, um, having sliced apples is, is really helpful to be able to make, you know, the best use of our labor. Mary or David? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, like tomato sauce is a great example. You know, um, I would love to be able to do, you know, 100% in-house marinara, you know, buying glut tomatoes in season and, and freezing them. But um, there's just no way because the volumes I go through on that are just so crazy. So finding a good local processed or minimally processed product is actually beneficial to us. Um, and uh, for instance, our fish comes in filleted. We're not actually cutting, cutting our seafood, although I would love to do that. But then at the same time, we've had a real challenge with, um, and this is for those of you who are producers or managing food hubs, um, we have gotten, you know, cut, you know, pre-cut or pre-prepped in some way vegetables and um, have stopped doing a lot of, um, like we used to get a lot of cubed squash, cubed butternut, and it, it just wouldn't hold. It had um, a really horrible shelf life in our coolers. And so even though I would love to be able to get that local stuff, you know, already seeded and peeled and diced, um, we've had to go back to cutting our own sweet potatoes and butternut squash and things like that because I was throwing out too much product. And so whether that was an issue of, you know, poor, poor FIFO at my distributor or poor handling here, um, either way for certain, certain items, we just have to do it in house. Otherwise our waste levels are too high. David. Um, I think um, for us, it, there's, there's always, we get a, a ton of a ton of produce um, that comes in. Sort of our core, basic vegetables come in um, already sort of prepped, like you know onions, um, broccoli florets, cauliflower florets, um, carrot uh, carrots. That those sorts of things um, that we end up, when it's not the season for those things, we get pre-cut. Um, but I have been able to work with the guy that that cuts them for us to really uh, uh, negotiate a, a, a price that is sort of within reason, um, but also a, a very specific cut. So certain carrots I want, I'm pretty specific on, on sort of an oblique cut um, or, you know, a certain size dice or a certain size julienne. And we've been able to sort of to, to, to land on something that actually, that works for, for what we're doing. And for those things, it's been huge because that saves us time that ultimately we can then put towards processing things that we don't get pre-cut. I mean, for, for the large part for us, all local vegetables that come in are coming in completely raw. Um, and that's, I, mean, I would love to be able to get some of that, like, you know, beets peeled or, but I think for me, it's really, um, I wanna focus more on sort of being able to get the ingredients in and, and understanding that bang for a buck wise, it's, it's obviously more expensive to be buying, to be buying locally. Um, and I would rather sort of take some of that, some of that labor in on, our, on ourselves. And because, um, we really see staff get staff engagement go up when they're working with vegetables from that raw state. And it's also students also get to see sort of what things look like before it becomes something else before it's prepped into a dish and, and, and 
while it's it's difficult, that's just sort of what we've been seeing. Great. Many of you, when you registered for this webinar, answered a question about what your top challenge was currently, and I can see it reflected in in the questions that are being asked now too around, you know, how to handle with naysayers or pushback about cost um, availability. And I encourage folks to be scanning the, the chat because there are some great examples being shared among the participants right now about strategies they've used for making the case internally to their uh, supervisors or the business officers at the, the institution as needed and also customer engagement strategies. So I encourage you uh, to take a, a look at that, and, and that is in response to some of the uh, questions that folks have, have posed here. I'm, I'm wondering, too, if there is the opportunity or if you, any of you have examples of, uh, on the relationship front of storage or things like that with your dis distribution partners that allows you more flexibility in menuing in items that might suddenly become available. So I know, for instance, um, an account in the West used to um, basically almost plan for uh, an abundance of tomatoes and onions in certain seasons. And they worked with Cisco, in that case, out there um, to, uh, to hold all of that item for them at times, uh, both prior to it, to it being processed and then also after it being processed. So I'm wondering if there are strategies that any of you have developed with your distribution partners that again assess, uh, assist in, in being able to extend the, the menu flexibility uh, for incorporating local and regional items. You know, one of the things that we've done, Holly, that's worked very well, um, particularly, you know, for us, it's when there's a, a glut in the market and the price drops on, say, grass fed beef in January because nobody wants to pasture their beef, um, we'll pick up a couple extra knowing that we'll need them. And by working with uh, the slaughterhouse, um, We've been able to use their freezer space to then trickle out the uh, the delivery of those those animals, and so that's been one of the tactics that we've used, particularly with proteins. Um, but there's always opportunities when you're you're looking at a bulk buy of something to use your your vendors. You know, I know the Black River has been good to us in the past in saying, you know, we'll take the thousand pounds or whatever that you're trying to clear out, but we've got to break it up into two deliveries. Um, and that gives them the guaranteed sale and allows us to be able to stage our, our storage. And so I think using your distributors and aggregators as partners is a, a really great opportunity to save some money, but also to continue to invest in those local relationships. Mary or David, did you have anything to, to add to that? I think those are really good points and things that, that we've done also. I mean, I, you know, if I can say one thing about that, and, and this is sort of second thing second what Mike said, it's really to, to really push your vendors. I mean, I think, you know, um, I, 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 it's always sales reps for, for large, for broadliners or, or for distributors are, are, are very good in getting things that they want, but they're not always so good in getting us what we want. And I think, and so it's really important to, to really push them to understand what it is that you're looking for. And if it's something that they can't, that they don't have it currently and they're not able to get, put it on them to really do that work for you and, and that legwork to, to look around and, and think about, okay, as the broadliner here or whatever the vendor is, how can I sort of be the middleman to figure that out? And then even if you end up not using, using them to, to go through with that relationship or not, that they'll always get you that work. And, I, and you know, and I think that I don't feel bad about using my broadliner sales rep or, or most sales rep for that matter in sort of figuring out that research because ultimately it's research that is going to help them do their job better anyway. Mary, final word. Well, we have um, no storage space, as I know you've seen, Holly, when you've walked through our area. Yes. Um, so um, our only choice is to, you know, sort of take a hybrid model of what David and Mike are sort of talking about. And I won't necessarily pre-purchase, but I will pre-commit to, um, you know, like our beef, for instance, uh, Northeast Family Farms knows what we're going to use for the rest of the year. So I can sort of lock in that price. Um, but it's very, very challenging for us. And one of the things we're working on in the next year is finding ways to warehouse and stockpile uh, product to, um, you know, help balance seasonality and, and availability. Great. Um, and Mary is not kidding when she says no storage space. Um, it's not an understatement. 
the I want to I'm I'm conscious of the the time and Caitlin and Michael appreciate that I'm conscious of time and uh, I think that um, I'm going to transition it back to to them to handle a few final announcements but I want to thank uh, Fine for for hosting this and for the opportunity to to facilitate what seems like a speed round of Q and A and thank you to our panelists Mike Webster of Hotchkiss Mary Riley executive chef at uh, Westfield State University and David Gould, ex ex executive chef at RISD, um, for their excellent preparation. And to all of you, uh, the chat is still uh, going strong. And any Q, uh, any questions that we didn't have a chance to answer, um, we've captured, and we'll get back to the the individuals that that pose them. So um, don't feel like you you've missed out. And with that, I'm going to transition it back to um, Mike and Caitlin. Yeah, thanks, Holly. Uh, thank you so much for moderating. It was a, it was a nice discussion. There was uh, some good questions answered in the chat as well as uh, with the panelists. Um, I'd like to thank Mary, Mike, Mary, and David again for providing some great examples of how they incorporate local food into their menus. Um, and for those of you attending the webinar today, we really hope that you know you you're coming away with some practical tools for changing your own menu at your dining operation. Uh, Caitlin shared a survey in the chat for you to provide feedback on this forum um, and also to share some ideas. For, uh, for us to provide in upcoming forums, if there's any topics that you would like covered um, in, in this kind of a format. Um, I'll, send you an e I'll send everyone an email with a reminder for that um, if you missed it in the chat. Um, our next forum will be in May and it will feature speakers in discussion on the topic of engaging students around local food. Um, so that, that will be May 31st. Um, and I, I, you can see that on our website. Um, also, I'd like to, to let you know that if you're a campus dining operator, um, we've just started a new Google group listserv for you to connect with your peers to ask some of the questions that you've been asking today. Um, it's just for campus dining operators. Um, it's a space for you to ask questions, share announcements, um, and just generally connect with each other outside of these events. Um, and you know, as always, if you'd like to get more involved with FINE or the Pharmacy to Campus Network, uh, you can contact me at mike at farmedinstitution.org. Um, and I would like to thank everyone again for coming. Have a nice day and see you later. Thanks everyone.